All right, welcome back. Hope you're all having a great week. Today, we're continuing our RBT exam practice question series, where we're going through a series of practice questions and breaking them down together. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. If you're looking for our proven study materials, please check out rbtexamreview.com. We do recommend our combo pack, which includes everything, including flashcards. It's our best deal. We also have our competency study guide as well. Congratulations to everyone who recently passed their exam. When you do pass, let us know so we can include you in our shout out. Other than that, questions, comments, let me know. I'd love to help. Work hard, study hard, and let's get to our questions. Question one, my neighbor starts mowing the lawn at 6 a.m. in the morning. I text him to please wait an hour so he turns off the lawnmower. I now text my neighbor when he is too loud. Turning off the lawnmower is what? Behavior question. When we are looking at a behavior question, first thing we need to do is identify what behavior, what antecedent, what consequence are we concerned with? In this case, we're concerned with turning off the lawnmower. So let's start to look at what's going on around the behavior or consequence or antecedent of interest. You know your neighbor is mowing the lawn at 6 a.m. in the morning. The text goes to the neighbor. When the text is received, the neighbor turns off the lawnmower. And now you continue to text the neighbor when he is too loud. Has your behavior increased or has it decreased as a result of the neighbor turning off the lawnmower? Well, it's increased, right? Now, anytime, anytime you text the neighbor, or should I say, anytime the neighbor is loud, you're going to text them because in the past, that behavior has been reinforced by the lawnmower being turned off. So we know it's reinforcement. Is this positive or negative? Remember, Positive reinforcement, we're adding some sort of stimuli. Negative reinforcement, we're taking something away. Often negative reinforcement is associated with escape or avoidance. With the text, the noise of this lawnmower right, is taken away. Okay, Because remember, we're texting him when he is too loud. So the lawnmower noise is too loud. When we text him, we're escaping lawnmower noise, which is increasing our behavior. So we're taking it away, it's increasing our behavior, we're looking at negative reinforcement. Negative reinforcement might be the most difficult out of these four. It's not hard, but it is the most difficult out of these four. Just remember, look at what, hap what is happening to the behavior. Is the behavior increasing? Is it decreasing? That's going to tell you if it's reinforcement or punishment. And then you simply just say, well, was the consequence added or removed? In this case, the noise is removed because we've turned off the lawnmower. We're escaping it. Turning off the lawnmower is negative reinforcement. I want to play tennis with my daughter, so I start to write down the steps that I could would, that I would teach her in order for her to learn how to hit a tennis ball. This most closely resembles what? Pretty simple question, pretty straightforward question. Try and answer this without even looking at the answer choices. Can you predict it? What are we doing in this case? Well, we want to play tennis, so we write down steps that you would teach her to learn how to hit a tennis ball. When we're going through the process of writing down the steps of a more complex chain, what are we doing here? Are we task analyzing or is this some sort of chaining? Remember, the task analysis leads to the type of chain. So before we can chain, we need to do a task analysis. The task analysis is the actual process of breaking down the behavior into steps. In this case, hitting a tennis ball, we're breaking down that into steps, which is our task analysis. Once we complete the task analysis, then we can decide, do we want to forward chain this? Do we want to backwards chain it? Or do we want to total task chain it? The task analysis goes hand in hand with chaining, but they serve two very distinct purposes. The task analysis creates the chain. The chain teaches the behavior. Remember that. A reactive intervention is considered a blank intervention, and a preventative intervention is considered a blank intervention. You might have seen this question before if you studied with me before, what, but I wanted to include it again because it came up earlier when I was talking to a student. Very important that we know that we have interventions and then we have specific antecedent and consequence interventions. Antecedent interventions meaning it occurs before the response. Consequence interventions, meaning, of course, it occurs after the response. More specifically, an antecedent intervention is usually meant to prevent a behavior from occurring. If we are arranging the environment in a way 
that is going to be the most conducive to preventing some sort of behavior, we are doing an antecedent intervention. A consequence intervention is more reactive. Now, the behavior has already occurred. We have to decide what we're going to do, right? So a reactive intervention is considered a consequence intervention, and a preventative intervention is considered a antecedent intervention. So if we look at our answer choices, A, antecedent and consequence, not in the right order. C and D are positive and negative. Be careful using these words positive and negative, right? What do they mean in ABA? Well, positive means we're adding something. Negative means we're taking it away. Don't use them in the other context, okay? What we're looking for here is a reactive intervention is considered a consequence intervention, and a preventative intervention is considered an antecedent intervention. Remember this, right? We have antecedent interventions. We have consequence interventions. If it occurs before, it's an antecedent intervention. We're preventing or being proactive. If it occurs after, it's a consequence, and we're being reactive. Look at the chart below. Out of the 12 trials, what is the percentage of occurrence of the response? Well, what is percentage of occurrence? Of course, it's a type of measurement. And what are we trying to determine? We're trying to determine how often something happens given the opportunity, okay? Given the number of trials, given the number of SDs, whatever it might be. What is the percentage of occurrence of the behavior happening, right? So if we have all 12 trials, we're counting all 12 trials. If we want to find percentage of occurrence, we see that plus is correct and minus is incorrect. We need to count each individual response, find out how many times it happened out of 12. Well, one and two, it happened. So we have two. Five, it happened. We have three. Then seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, it all happened. So we have a total of eight. Now to find the percentage of current of occurrence, we just divide how many times it happened, eight, by the total number of possibilities, 12, and we get 67%. Very easy questions like this, okay? Don't let the math intimidate you. You should be able to do this very simply. Percentage of occurrence. How often does the behavior occur? We know we're looking at of the 12 trials. Count them up, divide them, get your percentage, get this question right. Okay, sticking with the same chart. Look at the chart below. If trials to criterion was the measurement and the criterion was three correct responses in a row, what trial would you master the program? We switched it up. No longer are we looking at percentage of occurrence. We're now looking at trials to criterion. What does trials to criterion mean? It means we set a mastery criterion, a mastery requirement, where whatever that mastery criterion is, the client has to hit it before we master it out. Typically, you might see it written as must perform behavior three times in a row, sometimes must perform behavior three sessions in a row, whatever it would be. Trials to criterion says, okay, how many trials did it take to reach that goal? In this case, it's asking a little different question. It's asking you specifically, what trial would you master the program? Well, if we look at our chart, we know plus is correct and minus is incorrect. And the criterion is well, two correct responses in a row, right? So we're actually going by this, not by this. But if our criterion was three correct responses in a row, we need to find that criterion. So one and two, we both have pluses, but then we have a minus, so we have to reset. Five, we have a plus, but then a minus. Seven, eight, nine, three correct responses in a row. Now we've hit our criterion. Our answer is going to be C. Now assume that our criterion requirement was two correct responses. When would you master it out? Well, if we look at trials one and two is correct, two correct responses, mastering it out at two, right? So if our criterion is three correct responses in a row, we know it took nine trials to master the program. If our criterion is two correct responses total, we know it only took two trials to master to criterion or achieve the criterion. Understand this is a very useful measurement tool, right? We can really see how fast someone's obtaining a skill and it's how goals are typically written. We want some sort of criterion to measure. Can you do this consistently? Any change in the environment is considered a what? All right, kind of an easy question. I just want people to be aware of what a stimulus is. 
Um, I know a lot of RBTs, when they first start in the field, they're kind of confused at what a stimulus is. Think of a stimulus as anything that occurs in the environment. Consequences, antecedents, something moves, something smells, something falls, something is said. Anything occurring in the environment, it's a stimulus, okay? Be careful. A punisher and a reinforcer are types of stimulus. A consequence, whatever it might be, is a change in the environment, so it's also a stimulus. Stimulus is just kind of an all-encompassing word for all these different things, right? More specifically, any change in the environment is a stimulus. A nonverbal 10-year-old learns to communicate his address and phone number using his AAC device, the augmentative communication device. Now the 10-year-old will walk up to strangers and give these strangers his address and phone number. This is an example of what? Well, it's a problem, right? However, we're looking for a specific term. We know the 10-year-old can do this behavior because now he's going up to strangers and giving strangers his address and phone number. Not really what this is probably for, right? We need to now shape it down. It's great he learned how to do it, but right now is he not generalizing? Is there a lack of generalization? No, there's too much generalization. It's going to be an example of overgeneralization, right? We're doing it too much. It should be a safety skill. It should only be contained to a specific time and place. We're doing it way too often. Overgeneralization. Is it an example of maintenance? Well, maybe, right? But we, we still might be teaching it. We're not sure. We should still be teaching it if it's overgeneralized to this extent. And then a lack of maintenance. Again, we're not quite sure. Okay. We don't know if we've done teaching it. Clearly, it's an example of overgeneralization. You're teaching a client how to fold towels. You tell the client to start folding. If the client pauses or starts to struggle, you touch their elbows and then work your way up to hand over hand prompting. Once they start doing the task correctly, you fade the physical prompt. This is an example of blank. What type of prompting do we just use physical prompting as much as necessary and then we fade immediately? That's what the question is asking. It's clearly a prompting scenario, so we can eliminate A, negative reinforcement, leads us to delayed prompting, least to most prompting, and graduated guidance. Well, are we using least to most? Well, no, because we're jumping straight to physical prompting, right? Least to most is going to be starting way down the hierarchy. It's not delayed prompting, okay? Delayed prompting is when we slowly increase the time until we enter the prompt, right? In this case, we're using graduated guidance. Graduated guidance is a specific type of physical prompting where we only introduce as much physical prompting as needed, slowly more and more and more, and then immediately fade it away when it's no longer needed. Remember that graduated guidance is a type of physical prompting. And then finally, of the following, what do you want to avoid when defining behaviors? What do we want when we define behaviors? We want to be objective. We want to be observable. We want to be measurable. And we want to avoid giving things like our opinion, our subjective thoughts. Okay. So A, identifying a measurable component of the behavior. Well, you don't want to avoid that. We need to measure the behavior somehow, some way. We need to find something related to, beha to the behavior, a component of the behavior that is measurable. Be objectively describing the behavior. You always want to be objective. You just want the facts. Ob objectivity is the name of the game when you're defining behaviors. C, providing the subjective view of what happened before the behaviors. Do we just want to go off of our opinion or how we felt? No, we need to go off what we saw, and exactly what we saw. Don't editorialize. Don't change it up. Just give you the most objective view possible. And then D, hypothesizing the function of the behavior. Well, of course you want to hypothesize the function of the behavior. That's the most important thing to figure out. What is the function, right? Why is it occurring? So of the following, what do you want to avoid? C, providing the subjective view of what happened before the behaviors. Okay, thanks for watching. Please check out rbtexamreview.com for our study materials. Please like and subscribe if we are helping you out and if you're enjoying this material. Congratulations to everybody who recently passed. Everybody else, let us know when you do. Work hard, study hard. We'll see you soon.